Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Teachers Talk Radio Live. Uh, really excited uh, for this interview uh, with everything that's been going on in the last three or four days. Um, Catherine, your name has been trending on social media about eight times in the last two or three days. How, how does that feel? I didn't know that until you just said it. So <laughs> It's always appearing on the right-hand side, Catherine Burble saying it's always there. Um, <laughs> but but w welcome. And obviously the main reason I invited you on was to talk to you about things that have been going on in the last, let's say, three or four days. Um, Michaela um, is facing a high court challenge from a pupil over a policy banning prayer rituals. Um, so in case any of our international listeners don't know or, or anybody listening to this as a podcast might not know, um, Michaela is, is a, a free school in Brent in Wembley, North London. Um, it's subject to a, a judicial review over this policy, which was brought by an affected Muslim pupil who cannot be named for legal reasons. Um, first question I wanted to ask you, Catherine, is how did you personally feel when you realized that this was going to be made public? Because presumably you didn't want that to happen. Did, did you expect that it was going to happen? No, not at all. Um, so when all of this happened uh, last um, March time, um, somehow it didn't get into the main press. It was just on social media. So all of the nightmare that we had, um, the death threats, the racism, the... I mean, the terrifying experience that it was. Um, and, no, you know, not just for me, specifically uh, some of the staff as well. You know, uh, one of them had her uh, a brick through her window. Another one um, had an attempted break-in. There were bottles thrown in the yard. One of them, the racism that she received, uh, one of our black teachers uh, calling her a monkey and the N-word and the C-word and all kind. I mean... Horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Um, yeah, so I was terrified at the time that we'd get into the main press and somehow we managed to avoid it. And um, with the help of um, some lawyers managed to get uh, this stuff down that was out there because obviously our lives have been put in danger. Um, so after that, we asked uh, the courts for help to get a ban on the media uh, to stop them reporting on all of this because obviously... It was terrifying for staff and we were granted that media ban and I was really pleased because I thought, okay, we'll be fine going towards this court case because, well, the, the media can't report on it. And um, we then went to uh, court to, uh, this was on Tuesday morning, actually to ask for a private hearing. So courts are open in this country, which means that the press can go in, but it also means that now the press could have come into our court, but the, there was a media ban, so they couldn't report on it. Well, they could report on it, but they couldn't name me. They couldn't name the school. They couldn't name the teachers. They couldn't name the girl or her family or anything like that. And um, so we were asking for a private hearing because anyone could come into an open court and then put stuff on social media. And there was no ban on that. There was only a ban on the press. So we wanted a private hearing and our lawyers thought that we had quite a good case given all that we'd experienced before for it to be private. We certainly had not in a million years expected that not only would we not get a private hearing, but that the judge would lift the media ban. And that was what happened in the end. He lifted the media ban. Now, I mean, he, he listened to the members of the press who were there who made good arguments for, you know, public interest. He, you know, they said that that's what the press is for. It's for the public um, and the public are interested in this story. And he had to weigh up my interests and the interests of the public. And in the end, he said no teacher should be named. The family shouldn't be named. The girl shouldn't be named. But the school and I should be named. <laughs> so um, and I mean, I think that's partly because if you name the school, then you are not necessarily implicating me because I'm inextricably tied to the school. So um you know, I was very, very upset about it at the time because I desperately wanted it to stay out of the press. Um, but, you know, over the several days this has been going on now, I sort of think I can see the judge's point of view. You know, I can see that, 
you know, all, all leaders, I mean, any head teachers listening to this will know, or, you know, heads of department and so on will know as well, that you often have to weigh up um, the, 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 well, the desires and um, the interests of one party against another. And then you have to make difficult decisions. And that was what the judge had to do. And in the end, he went with the public. And I, I sort of see why he did. So while it wasn't very good for me, <laughs> I, I, I can understand now, I think, why he made the decision he made, especially given the, the interest that, it, like you say, I'm trending. Gosh, well, I suppose people are really interested. Can you tell us just a little, I know it's been well publicized, but can you tell us briefly just a, a bit of the background to the case um, against the school so our listeners can understand that and a, and a bit of the background from your perspective? Yeah. Um, so we have um, a very restrictive building. It isn't a normal school building. It, it shouldn't be a school. It's it's seven floors. It's um, uh, It really should be an office building. We don't have any grass or trees outside, no sports hall. Uh, we just have a car park that we use uh, for the kids to play in, which means the staff cannot park cars in 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 the school. Um, we uh, we have a special. I mean, we're known as the strictest school in Britain. We have silent corridors. Uh, the children don't carry their bags around. Um, we have a family lunch where the children serve each other food and um, clean up after each other. And all of this happens with staff there. That's important. And staff man the corridors when the children are going back and forth uh, in order to make sure that they are silent. And um, and so I think when people, so, and, and what is being said is that we don't have a prayer room and we ought to have a prayer room. Now I have to say all of the families are told when they uh, come to the school, you know, in March time, actually, we, we meet with all families in March when they've been given a place at Michaela. And we tell them what we're like because it's not just about prayer. That's one of the that's one of the many things that we tell them because we are very very different, you know. Uh, and not all families will necessarily want what we are offering. And um, some families think, "Oh, that's great! My kid is spinning out of control. This is the kind of school that I want." Uh, some families may think, "No, I don't want this for whatever reason." You know, so, uh, we don't have a sports hall. That can be a reason. Um, we. Um, we really emphasize the academic. That could be a reason. Uh, we have silent corridors. That could be a reason. We don't have a prayer room. That could be a reason. I mean, there are a million things. Uh, I go through the issues like um, we do Macbeth as a set text. So Jehovah Witnesses can think, well, is this really, is this what we want? And I, I often have conversations with families. It could be families of any faith where I explain why it is we have what we do. And then they decide. And uh, when we first began um, in 2014, about 30% of the population were, at the school was Muslim. We've grown that to 50%. So uh, with everyone being fully aware of the fact that we don't have a prayer room. So, you know, those Muslim families have weighed it up and said, you know what? Yeah, we'd prefer a prayer room. But actually, given everything else the school offers, we're going to go with what it offers. Um and I suppose that's what every family does when looking at any school. You don't like absolutely everything about it, but you make a decision according to whatever, you know, what your values are, what you like about the school, what you don't like about the school, and then you decide. Um, so, you know, the, the families are happy. You know, I, I think that's key for us to recognize. Now, uh, this girl clearly isn't, um, but any teacher knows that, you know, you, 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 you can... Um, get lots of kids on board with something but every now and again there's there's a kid who isn't necessarily on board with that was so the the sort of trigger for this correct me if i'm wrong was you there were groups of i think you mentioned in another interview like 30 sort of students or 20 students outside praying yes. in the yes, yard so, right yeah i can explain that so what we've always said is if you want you can pray in the yard because we can't have like, this idea of a prayer room first of all is silly We've got 350 Muslims. So obviously we'd need several prayer rooms. One would not be enough. Um, and we don't have the classroom space. I mean, we're always desperate for more classrooms. So suggestions have been made that the kids should come in and move furniture and that they would make their own way there. Remember our silent corridors, our strict behavior systems, 
all of that would go out the window. The bags are on pegs at the back of the classrooms where we'd have to make the kids now carry their bags. It, it would be a complete transformation of the school and the whole ethos would go out the window. And that's just physically in terms of the building. But then there's also the point about our ethos. Um, and it's what I always say about the children, which is that I'm very proud of them, not just for their results, but for who they are. And we instill values in our children, which are about being, um, uh, having a sense of duty towards others and making sacrifices about the things that you might want uh, in order to make sure that the whole succeeds. And we talk very much about being a team, being a team player. Um, and when guests come to the school, uh, we get 800 visitors a year. The thing they always comment on is how nice our children are. Now, we'd always said to the children, if you want, you can pray in the yard because at least we're not dividing the children according to race and religion. Because of our family lunch, because of the building, if we were to go ahead with, let's say we got rid of the bags and we got rid of the silent corridors and we let everybody upstairs, we wouldn't let everybody upstairs. We would have to let the Muslim kids go upstairs and the non-Muslim kids go downstairs. And we are not going to, I will never separate children according to race and religion. It's not going to be done. But do you think, just, just on that issue of the room though, do you think that it's realistic that all of those 300 students would would go to that those prayer rooms if they do you think yeah. that they'd all go or do yeah, you think I, it would be or, or do you think it would be more a case of well some students might go and if the rooms got full you would then say well the rooms the room is full no i think uh, they would just because i know from the number of families who ask about it when they're joining the school uh it, it's quite a normal thing for the muslim families to ask and then they say okay so they, they would prefer a prayer room. They're, they would go ahead without having one. But no, I do think, and certainly our experience when they started praying in the yard, because for eight years, nobody prayed and it everything was fine. And then um, I say nobody. I mean, apparently w once in the sixth form, they prayed, but the sixth form is different anyway. So forget about them. It's the lower school that matters because the sixth formers, they're allowed outside of school at lunchtime. They bring in their own food. They do their own thing. It's very, they don't walk in single file, etc. So they don't wear a uniform. Whereas the lower school kids, it's a very regimented thing. I mean, that's what we're known for. And um, when we saw, when they prayed in the yard, uh, which, as I say, hadn't happened for eight years before, it started off with a couple of kids. It grew and grew and grew. And part of the reason why it grew was because uh, Muslim kids who were not fasting, this was during Ramadan, they weren't fasting or they weren't praying um, or they, one girl who didn't have her head covered, one girl who, who then covered her head, uh, they would stand by the break hole where food was being handed out. And the Muslim kids who were eating were intimidated into not eating, or they were intimidated into praying. Um, one girl left the choir saying that it was haram to listen to music or to sing music. So, and this was very quickly over a few days, right? The whole culture of the school totally changed. And um, because if you come and visit, you see, I mean, it's unbelievable how happy and joyful our kids are and how, what a lovely kind place it is. And you know what was amazing is that once we took the decision to ban prayer, which was very quickly, you know, it was within a, you know some days. And partly the, one of the reasons why we did that was because then there was an online petition that was started about how uh, a prayer room was needed. And as I say, one prayer room would not be enough. And it would mean completely transforming the ethos of the school. And of course, we could be a normal school. I mean, that is possible. We could be normal. But... The whole point of Michaela is that we're not a normal school. <laughs> the whole point of Michaela is that we have a very specific ethos. And um, uh, having them pray in the yard outside, not only did it change the whole atmosphere, but it meant that my teachers were being racially abused, that we were being sent death threats, that people were scared for their lives. And I just don't think teachers should have to put up with that. But you're saying that was because of the praying outside or because yeah. of not, not having a prayer room? Like I'm asking, people why did those threats come outside. about? Because people saw them praying outside. And their so, reaction to that was? Outside. What's that? And, and the reaction to that was? Well, you know, a petition starts, this gathers, you know, thousands of people are talking about this online. There's a petition, There's uh, there are blogs that are written, um, there are emails that are being sent in threatening us. So there, there, there's a whole variety of people that are involved in this. Um, and you have no way of controlling it. That's the thing. 
There's no way of getting a handle on this. So not only was it the case that our little community had been disturbed uh, internally, it was also being threatened externally and our staff were being threatened. And um, it, I mean, it was scary. And I, I, I mean, I just think it's outrageous, the idea that teachers should have to uh, live in that kind of fear. So without stating the obvious, what, what did those people want you to do? The people who were threatening and petitioning, what, what exactly did they want you to do? Well, I suppose the idea is to have a prayer room. But like I say, that doesn't make any sense in our building with our ethos. But they don't know that. To be honest, most of them were just being abusive. You know, um, it, it wasn't even, they weren't necessarily asking for anything. They were just being abusive because- But it was, it was a direct reaction to you not allowing the prayer room. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was all to do with that, definitely. So co com coming back to the, ch to the students in the yard, there's, there's, a, there's a number of them now sort of praying in the yard. My, my question to you is, if those students had been Buddhists meditating, if mm -hmm. those students, if those students had been Christians sat in a circle in silence praying, or if those students had been playing tiddlywinks, right, as a as a group of 15 or 20, or however many it was, would you have had the same reaction? Now, the tiddly, tiddlywinks thing is interesting. Well, maybe not tiddlywinks, that was just me being yeah. uh, obtuse. Yeah. No, 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 no. But the reason why that's interesting is that children of any race and religion can participate in that. So that's different. Now, the other things, if it's for a few minutes, then who cares? I mean, that's we wouldn't have allowed prayer if we thought it, if there was a problem in the first place. Right. I mean, we did allow it. That's the whole point, because we thought they're all outside together. So we allowed it. It was only in allowing it and it going happening that we then saw the effect on the culture and how the school changed. But clearly, we didn't have a problem with it to begin with. Otherwise, we wouldn't have allowed it. So, so on the issue of, so, so you're saying that with regards to, to Buddhists meditating or Christians praying in silence, you're saying you would have had, you, you know, what would your reaction to that have been? Well, we allowed anyone to pray in the yard. So if they'd been praying, then that would have been fine. Um, but it's all on the understanding that it's only a few minutes. I mean, if they were doing it, say, for 15 minutes, then that's practically their whole lunch hour gone. And our lunch hour is, isn't is just the time where people just do what they want. Um, we are socializing the kids. We're making sure that um, if a child is being left out, we're bringing him into the fold. Um, we're making sure that children are kind to each other. And this creates an environment where, oh, I don't know, guests will often come in, teachers who will say, gosh, your children play basketball so nicely. Often we have to take the basketball away um, at our school. But here, look at this. It's all just so lovely. That's partly because of what we are doing all the time in terms of socializing the children and making sure that they know how to play nicely with each other, play across racial and religious divides and so on. So it, it's only if it's something brief, which is why we allowed it, because prayer is something brief. It's just that it changed the whole atmosphere and culture of the school into something really quite negative when normally everything is positive. And, you know, it was fascinating because when we did ban the prayer rituals from happening, everything just returned to normal. You know, Michaela is the happy place that you've known it when you visited and it's lovely. And it was like that from the day that that ban took place. I was gonna ask you a question. Andrew's asked this actually on um, social media. Um, do, do your school assemblies have prayers in them of any kind? Um, because he hasn't seen that explained in any coverage. And it was going to lead to a sort of question from me as well. And you've said very clearly that you want Michaela to be a safe, secular community. You, you mm -hmm. have used the word secular. Um, my question would be, have you used the word secular before this incident? Is that something that you've always said, I want Michaela to be secular? Um, and Andrew's question as well is, is, you know, in assemblies, have prayers of any, anything kind been said? No, we don't have prayers. Um, and our way of celebrating Christmas, for instance, is very secular. There's a Santa, um, there's a Christmas tree, but these these are all very secular things. We would never have a nativity play, for instance. We don't talk about Jesus. Um, we absolutely embrace the idea of secularism. And from the moment we opened in 2014, we've never had a prayer room. We've always made that clear to parents. I mean, and it's not just prayer rooms. Everything that we are, because we are different, we say that to parents 
And yes, you know, we use the word secular to describe ourselves. Um, Zahara has asked to, to confirm that the school was getting, or the school, people in the school, she asks, were getting death threats during Ramadan because students were praying. She's yes, asked. we were connected. The, yeah. Until they started praying, there were no death threats. When the prayer started, there was this whole, I mean, the, the death threats didn't come immediately. This campaign started, blogs were written, and then death threats came and the horrifying racism that, that one that, was subjected that, to. That brick through the window that you mentioned for a member of staff, was that was that at their home or in their classroom? No, their home. Right. And one of them had a break in, an attempted break in at her home. I mean, nothing like that's ever happened. In in the decade that we've been open, we've never had issues like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so... Uh, and when, thing... oh, yeah, prayer happened, when the prayer stopped, everything went back to normal, you know? Incredibly, really. I mean, we didn't know what was going to happen, and that is what happened. Um, Nadine Asbali, who is a teacher, I'm sure you've, you, you may have read this article that she wrote. Um, in the Guardian, because oh, I haven't. Um, well, G Gillian Key, I'm going to ask you this in a minute, but Gillian Keegan commented on it, um, and she said that the prayer ban was a dystopian, sinister version of Britishness, um, and she also said that never has this private spiritual act um, threatened the uh, cohesion. Um, of the schools in which she's worked, um, never has it diminished. Uh, my Britishness, um, and yet that is exactly the argument given by Catherine Burble Singh. Is that your argument? No, of She's course it is. She's saying it is. No, of course, you know, children may pray at home. I'm not saying they're less British for praying. I'm saying that our community, look, in the same way as the Jehovah Witnesses are not less British if they don't want to read Macbeth, and if they decide to go to another school that doesn't read Macbeth, it doesn't make them less British. But if they want to come to Michaela, then that's a choice they need to make because that's the text that we do at GCSE. And I don't think it's right that we should change that text and all of our resources um, in, in order to uh, uh, appeal to them. Similarly, I don't think it would be right for us to separate the Hindus who don't want to eat on the plates that have touched uh, eggs and separate them according to race and religion. I think it's wrong to separate children according to race and religion. She's imagining a school where children are all free to do whatever it is they want at lunch. And they all go into their different groups and they do whatever. And you know what? That's fine. I mean, those schools, please do have a prayer room that makes sense. It doesn't make sense for us because of the kind of school that we are, because of our ethos and because of our restricted building. Um, and if you don't know our school, then it doesn't seems to be silly. Well, come on, it's only five minutes, but it just can't work in our school. It's impossible. Now you might say, well, then you should be a normal school, but I think that would be wrong. I think that there are a whole variety of schools in Britain uh, that provide a you know varied uh, you know education, and um, it would be a great shame to destroy Michaela because that's what you'd be doing. It, Michaela would no longer be Michaela. It would become much more of a normal school. And why, but just to touch on that, Catherine, why? Because mm -hmm. you know, I get, I totally get the the ideas of you know, um, sort of uh, managing the behaviour in this across the school and and maintaining that consistent. I get all of that, um, but having the room close to the yard or something, and the doors sort of. <laughs> One room. You'd have to have several rooms. You'd have to have several rooms. And then, in fact, because you'd have to use the rooms that are already classrooms, you'd only be fitting four or five kids in at any one time. So you'd have to have do does like 10, 15, 20 rooms open. It would mean all of those rooms being open, the children being able to just find a place as they want and going through the corridors as they want. That is a, a, a abolishing our silent corridors, abolishing the bags in rooms. You know, one of the things is the children are very proud with their uniforms, being able to walk around the corridors without bags, without coats. You know, it completely transforms the look and feel of a school if they're wearing coats and bags. Now, I realize in lots of other schools that's normal and that's fine. And that, I'm not criticizing those schools. That's fine. They should do that. 
I'm saying for our school and our ethos and what we do and what those Muslim families come to us for, remember, they want this type of school. Those Muslim families that have grown from 30% to 50% have come to us precisely because of the kind of schooling that we offer. Otherwise, they'd go to the more normal schools that are elsewhere in Brent. They don't. So if you want what we're offering at Michaela, you need to do it without prayer rooms. Or you have a normal school with prayer rooms. But you can't have us, certainly not in that building. You cannot have Michaela. It's simply impossible. So, and I think it would be wrong to change us, you know, just like I think it'd be wrong for us to abandon Macbeth, just like I think it'd be wrong to uh, put the Hindu children uh, in a separate part of the uh, of the canteen to be able to eat. And once, I mean, Tommy, you've seen our school. You have a sense of what it is. Now, of course, you don't exist in the school working there. They're, all of our staff get it. There's no member of staff of ours who doesn't understand what I'm saying because we all know how the school works. Everybody understands that obviously we could not have prayer rooms. Like, it's just obvious. Do you think, though, that there's a lot of schools in the UK? Surely there must be at least one other school in the country that has prayer rooms where the discipline and behavior is good. There has to be. Do you know what I mean? By good. You know, I'm not saying that they're, those schools are bad. They're just very different to what we do, right? Our ethos and our way of which you've seen is completely different to what you see elsewhere. It's just it's just a totally different thing. And, um, and, and it's not just, okay, yes, we get these great results. Forget about the results. It's what we do with our children that I'm most proud of. And we would not be able to do that if we were forced into having prayer rooms. We just wouldn't. It would be a if different the, If Michaela's building was a new build and it had double the volume or size that it currently does, would you say yes to prayer rooms? Well, then I'd have to see the building. I would have to see whether or not we had enough staff because one of the big issues as well is if we have family lunch, we don't have the staff to be able to deploy. So, you know, you would have to perhaps abandon family lunch, which I always call the beating heart of the school. Um, so there are big demands being made uh, of the school, which is to transform it into a school that these families do not want. It, so we are misunderstanding when we think, but you can have this school and you can have all these prayer rooms, not possible. Now, if we had a different building, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to be in that building and I have to see what it was like and so on. I have no idea. It's hard to say. Um, but, but theoretically, yes. Theoretic, look, as I've, uh, uh, well, I haven't said here, so I'll say, I'll say this here. You want to allow children certain personal freedoms as long as they don't threaten the whole. So the girls wear hijabs, the Sikhs wear bangles, um, the Hindus wear their little bracelet things. You know, like we allow that because it doesn't threaten the happiness and the existence of the whole. It doesn't threaten our ethos. It doesn't say, you know what, Michaela, you're going to have to change who you are. So, and I would say that's the case. That's the kind of, that's the rule that you need to follow for everything, which is that if you're allowing something for children, is that something that's going to threaten the whole? So we don't allow them to have chats in cor corridors. That's something we don't allow them. Why? Because it threatens our ethos as a whole. We don't allow them to go outside at lunch. Why? Because it threatens our ethos as a whole, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of things we don't allow them to do because we are Michaela and that's who we are, you know? Um, just on the back of that article that was published by Nadine um, Asbali, I read a, a short segment from it earlier. Um, Gillian Keegan came out and she went on social media. She tweeted, she came out and defended you. She was, she was criticized for that. It was seen as quite controversial. Um, a lot of commentators in the replies and on social media were suggesting that that you and Michaela get special treatment from the government. And what would your message to Gillian be um, off the back of that tweet? And what would your message to the people critiquing it be? And also, my question as well was, if that was a Labour education secretary and they'd have done that with somebody, because it's very rare that, an education secretary step in, in by the way i could be wrong on this but i think it's quite rare that an education secretary comes out gunning for one school i know it's a high, high profile case and you know and all the rest i get all that that's probably and, why he's commented i don't I know get, I get all that. 
I've never met Gillian Keegan. I've never interacted with her. I've never, I, I, I have nothing to do with Gillian Keegan. I, people like to invent these stories about the government and how they're helping us. I, I have nothing to do with the government. I mean, <laughs> um, if anything, I, I find the government really annoying. You know, we tried to open a primary school. We were blocked. This is under the Conservative Party. We tried to set up a leadership program for other schools to learn from what we do. We were blocked. We tried to open up a secondary in Stevenage. That all fell apart, all under the Conservative government. We have not been able to expand. If the Conservative government were helping us, we would have four or five schools by now. We don't. It's been 13 years that we've been in this business of setting up Michaela and making it happen, that I've been involved in this project. 13 years, haven't expanded at all. If you look at all the other chains, their academy chains and so on, they're expanding all the time. We have not been able to. So this idea that people have of the government helping us, I don't know Gillian Keegan, I've never met her. I mean, she tweeted, I don't know what she tweeted, but um, you know, thanks Gillian, that's nice. I don't know, what do you want me to say? I mean, I just, more, more you know. my, my, my question was more that whether, whether, you know, if that wasn't you, and that was some other school for some other reason, right? Yeah. Uh, promoting something that you didn't like uh, mm -hmm. at all. And the education secretary publicly went out and said, I like this. And I, 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 this is how we're doing it. This is, you know, I'm backing this person. Would you go along with that? That's what I'm asking. I'm not asking whether you, you like what she said. I'm, I'm asking whether you would be okay with an, another education secretary sort of, going out there for one school or a, or a, or a group of schools there like that. There are sorts of things that politicians do that I like or don't like. Rishi Sunak and this whole uh, mu must have maths to 18 and his uh, British standard. I think it's a load of nonsense. I've written about it being ridiculous. Um, I'm horrified by it. Uh, I'll write again about how I'm horrified by it. I mean, that's what you do. Politicians do stuff and then you comment about it. I have no idea whether or not she would comment on somebody. I mean, I'm not responsible for Gillian Keegan. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I can't, I don't know why she did what she did. I presume because it's high profile. Um, she's never been interested to come and see us. She's never got in touch with us. So I, I assume it's because it's just a high profile case. And so she said something. I, I have no idea. Okay. So, so um, moving on from there, um, because we've got limited time. So there's a few more bits I want to sort of try to cover if we can in the time we've got left. Um, you've, you've said that schools need to need the support to, to make it work. You know, schools need to be enabled to actively encourage a multicultural environment. And you've said that that might include things like the law and the media and, and other things. You said this in another interview. What, what exactly do you want the law and the media and other institutions to do to help schools in your view um, yeah. support multiculturalism? Well, I mean, it's less about supporting multiculturalism. It's more that I find it worrying that uh, um, parents can just take schools to court uh, whenever, you know, um, that they can get financial support to do this and uh, they can really torpedo a school. Um, headship is really hard. Um, I know that, uh, many of your listeners will, um, you know, uh, will be interested in Ruth Perry and, you know, the, the kind of stresses that heads can be under, uh, and how awful it is. Um, well, one of the stresses that heads can be under is the chances of a, of a parent just taking you to court. And, um, sometimes when you're under that kind of pressure, it means that you give in to parents and do things that are not necessarily the right thing for the school because it can be quite daunting and terrifying uh, being taken to court. And I think that that, you know, that that's worrying, I think, for head teachers and for our schools generally. I'm a head teacher. Um, I've been a teacher all my life. And I very much believe in protecting teachers and looking after them. And I um, I think it's it's well, it's just. It, that that loophole that there is there, uh, I think, is is worrying for us. It's already the case that people don't respect us, you know, generally in the public, I think. I think that people, uh, you know, the business of if you can't, you teach. And people think they've been to school, therefore they know how to run a school, they know how to teach a class. And I don't think they know at all. And I think that uh, ordinary people can misunderstand what... Um, 
just how challenging teaching is, just how challenging headship is, and how difficult it is to make a school successful. And so I just wish that our legal system um, were better equipped to, to, to support teachers and head teachers. And in terms of, um, th there was one other question I wanted to ask, which was about Ofsted, because you, you've said in the past, we, we've had an interview in the past where you said, ignore Ofsted. I'm not interested in Ofsted. Um, and you, you've sort of, you know, you've said that. You've said that, basically. You've said, ignore Ofsted. Don't, don't worry about Ofsted. And don't get involved in Ofsted. You know, like, just let them get on with their thing. You get on with their thing. But then equally, there's people who say, well, hang on a minute, Catherine. You've, you, you know, you've included in your statement, Michaela is rated outstanding by Ofsted. You know, and stuff like that. So some people are viewing that and saying, hang on a minute. You know, is there a... Is there a contradiction there? Yeah. So it's true that I don't put Michaela's Rated Outstanding by Ofsted on, I don't know, on the website or on the, 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 the banners that we have outside of school and so on. I don't care about that. But for this particular situation, which is um, highly contentious and is putting my life at risk, uh, and we need to, where we have been thrown into the limelight, which I did not want, and we're having to defend why we've, you know, the prayer situation... Uh, it's important to say that uh, in my statement so that people who have never heard of us, don't know anything about us, have some sense of, oh, I see, it's a good school. Now, I agree with you about Ofsted. You know what I think about Ofsted. But in this particular situation, it makes sense to say that because otherwise um, they won't, people won't realize that we are really an excellent school. Catherine, I know we've run out of time and I don't want to take any more of your Sunday away from you. So thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate that. And, um, and yeah, thank you. All right, Tom. Thank you very much for having me.